If you are clicking online and you're watching us by video, we want you to know that you can go to the website um, of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church and you can actually download the notes that our members have in this setting right now. You can print them out and they help you to understand the message that much more. Um, as well, I want you to know that the outlines or the messages are not only available through the Monday message in our website, but there are also messages available through a podcast. So if you go to our website, you can find information about our podcast or our app. We want you to be able to listen to the message, share the message, be able to reflect on the message as we go. We have come to this beautiful picture in Philippians of the Apostle Paul dealing with unity. Today, we come to don't grumble and argue, show Christ by unity. Now, it's very interesting. Um, I would say as best I can tell, about um, 10% of the people in this room don't deal very much with the issue of grumbling um, and disputing. I would say about 90% of the people in this room deal with grumbling and disputing. This is my own personal guess. Um, I think about 90% of us deal with this as a common struggle, a common weakness. Now, this morning we're going to look at um, the passage that comes from Philippians about dealing with, with the Philippian church, but we're going to see that this principle isn't just about church life, though it's very much about church life, especially from this setting, but really the principle overflows out into every area of our life. This has to do with your marriage. This has to do with your family, your parenting. This has to do with your parents, kids, and your relationship to your parents. This also has to do with your work life. This has to do with your neighbors. This has to do with your extended family. This begins to play out into all the areas of our life and maybe even when we're at Publix or at Target or um, how about this, driving in South Florida traffic. Just this week, I struggled with grumbling. I struggled with grumbling when I went down to see my parents and heard about some of the shenanigans of the neighbors nearby. I was grumbling on behalf of my parents. I was grumbling when I drove through Miami traffic coming back on Thursday, seeking to be here to get here to a meeting. I sat down with people that were dealing with various issues of life that have brought about disputes and argue, arguing, um, people that are struggling deeply with some of those things. I spoke with someone in ministry who their church is deeply struggling with grumbling and disputing and arguing. Now, if somebody is new to us this morning, they might think, wow, Sheridan Hills is dealing with uh, grumbling. This sermon must be aimed at a few people in the church. Um, this, I, we happen to be here for the first time, and he's preaching on grumbling. This church must have trouble that he's trying to deal with from the pulpit. Well, I would say to you two or three things. Number one, you'd have to go look and see that we study the Bible verse by verse as we go. So whatever comes up in the next passage, we just deal with it. And God is amazing in the way that he helps us, helps us with that and deals with all the touchy subjects um, that come up in the passage, so we have to deal with them. There are some churches that avoid tough subjects, avoid tough theologies, ab avoid tough, tough standards, um, and so they, they want to avoid those, and so they don't preach through the Bible. Um, verse by verse. We do, and so God just brings up whatever He wants whenever we need it. Um, the second thing I would say about that is the pastors in this church do not hide behind the pulpit when it comes to dealing with issues. In fact, we would much rather deal with things when they come up on a personal basis. We believe that that's more redemptive than being passive-aggressive from the pulpit. So I just want to assure you that that's not the attitude of our hearts. We want to deal with the body as we deal with the body and the individuals as we deal with individuals. Isn't that a better way? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Billingsley told me, don't ever say anything from the behind the pulpit that you wouldn't say some to someone face to face. Yes. So 
That's an important. Now, there's, there's sometimes I would say things face to face that I wouldn't necessarily say behind the pulpit. Um, don't want to hurt the sheep that don't need to be, that don't need to be corrected. Um, but we want to be careful about this. Um, so let's, let's go to the passage. In, in the box on the page, we studied verse 12 and 13 last week. You remember that? Um, look what 12 says. Therefore, my beloved brothers, as you, is alway, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, this is what we studied last week, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Um, let's look at the background and context because now the, in verse 14 and the others we're going to study. But look at the background. Number one, Paul is dealing with the issue of disunity and, or unity and disunity in the Philippian church. That's verses 1 all the way through 18. He brings it up at the beginning of the passage, and then he goes into this beautiful section. Number two, Paul has just reminded the Philippians of the model that they have in Christ Jesus, and the beautiful model of his, and I put this word on here because I want you to see it, his condescension. What do we mean by that, his condescension? What does that mean? Yes coming down. He leaves heaven and he condescends to the earth. This is what we could also call the other, what's the other big word? The very good, the incarnation. So this is the condescension of Christ. He leaves the halls of heaven. He comes and joins us on earth in human form, otherwise known as the incarnation. He puts on flesh. He comes and he becomes a man for us. His earthly life, which was characterized by obedience, and not only obedience to death, but death on a cross, a place of cursing. And because of that, the Father resurrected him and exalted him as Lord of all. Now, this is our example of how to deal with unity. We deny ourselves and we honor Christ by his power. This is how dealing with disunity in your home, this is how dealing with disunity in a church, even at work, it always, the, the ways of God always work. You go down before you go up. You come down to the place of humility, identifying yourself with Christ. As Jesus was humble and humbled himself, if he can do that, being the Son of God, then certainly Andrew Coleman and Ted Capella and Marie Arias, all of us can come before Christ, humbling ourselves before him. So this is the picture of how to deal with it. Number three is very important. Look at number three. In light of Christ's humiliation, that's him coming to the earth and dying on the cross, and his exaltation, that's the Father lifting him up, the Philippians are to fill it in, are to live out God's salvation of them by living in unity with one another through the example and the power. Both of those are important. The example of Christ and the power of Christ. Not in your own strength, but in his strength. Now, number four is what we studied last week. Verses 12 through 13 declare the great, what did we call it? The great what? Paradox. It's a seeming, it's a seeming inconsistency. Uh, there seems to be a, a contradiction here, but it's not a contradiction. We see our work coinciding with God's work in our lives. Now, He always supersedes it, but yet we are involved. The Christian life is about obedience. In fact, we, we just see that. Look in verse 13 up there at the top in the box. In verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We see that, Isaiah, that idea in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Very important passage. Let's read chapter 2 and verse 10 out loud. Now, I want you to notice what it says about our work and God's work, okay? Look what it says in verse 10. Let's read it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, so, so we were saved for this purpose of good works. In starting point, we've talked about the fact that we're, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved for good works. And so we're, we're saved by the grace of Christ and saved by the grace of God in giving us Christ and belief upon him. But then why are we saved? We are saved to obey him and to do what he says. Marcy and Cheryl and I and Andrea lived in a country called Algeria, northern Algeria. There was an ancient um, 
theologian that lived there, an ancient pastor, his name was Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. And Hippo is a city. Um, it's not like hippopotamus. Um, Hippo stands for horse, and it was a, a town with um, horses uh, that were there, but it was a, an ancient city in Algeria called Hippo. Today it's called Anaba. Um, but there in, in Hippo, or modern-day Anaba, there are huge Roman ruins that are there, and there's a church that is there. And the church was very obviously the church that Augustine preached the gospel from after he got saved and became a pastor. Augustine was one of the early theologians that began to really think through uh, a bit of systematizing and a bit of seeking to define what is the Bible saying about his work and our work. And Augustine started to see that, wow, God is not only big, but his work in our salvation is big. He does the heavy lifting. He's the one who comes and redeems us. It's not us. Augustine began to see that and began to read that or began to write about that. And so it's very helpful. But notice what he says here. Our deeds are our own because of free will producing them, and they are also God's because of his grace causing us to produce them. So that's what we see in Ephesians 2.10. That's what we see in Philippians 2.13 is that God is at work in us. Look at the next statement. God makes us do what he pleases by making us desire what we otherwise would not desire. What he's saying is, is if God hadn't come and saved you, if God hadn't come and done a work in you, you would have never desired him, and you would have never desired his righteousness, and you would have never desired to honor him. Augustine sees that rightly throughout the Scripture, that it's God at work in you. You see, while we were still helpless, Christ died for us. In 1 John it says, we love not because we loved him first, but because he loved us first. You see, this is why we often would say that God is the prime mover. He's the first mover in our salvation. He comes and he does a work and he enables us, gives us even faith and desire to obey him. So, if we do anything good, who's to thank for it? God, not us. I mean, if it, when, when we start to really look at our lives, if there's any good in us, it's because of the grace of God. It's his goodness that he would reach down and save us and he would empower us and work in our hearts and help us with the desire to know him and love him. And I understand that it may be a struggle, but that's part of what faith is. And that's part of the picture that is there. God is working in us. So if all of this is here, notice what it says in verse 14. Do all things without, what does it say? Grumbling or disputing. First of all, notice that this section begins with the word do. You see, the Christian life is a, is a life of action. It is a life of obedience. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Now, that is language from the Old Testament. That is language describing the people that had come out of Egypt and were on their way to the promised land, but they kept blowing it. They kept dishonoring God. They were a crooked and wicked generation. Toward, they were constantly turning toward idolatry, and they were constantly dealing with sexual immorality. They were constantly dealing with a lack of faith. And so part of this, we see here the Apostle Paul is referring to this, this proneness that we have toward not honoring God. Look at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Verse 16. Hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud of you that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am uh, be, to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you, all, likewise you also should be glad and rejoice in me. Now, remember with me that one of the reoccurring themes throughout the book of Philippians is the idea of joy and rejoicing. 
which is kind of amazing because Paul is writing this from a prison cell. And he's writing to people who are struggling. They're writing, he's writing to a people in Philippi who are struggling with the Roman culture around them attacking them for their faith and rejecting them for their faith. And they're not only struggling from the outside attack, but they're struggling from some of these things on the inside, including their own grumbling and arguing and disputing. Now, this word that is here, grumbling, it's a very interesting word that, that comes up. The idea of grumbling is it actually comes um, from uh, the way it sounds, um, and the way it is. So it's kind of like this. Think about this idea. What does a bee do when it's flying around? It buzzes. We say it buzzes, right? Well, what does it sound like when it's buzzing? Buzz, buzz right? It goes buzz. It's the same idea with the word grumbling. And it's very interesting that it's the same in English as it's not the same word in the way it's pronounced, but it's the same idea that when we grumble, it's kind of, we grumble. The word grumble sounds like what we do. It uses a guttural um, pronunciation, grum, uh, <coughs> grumble. I mean, that's, that's part of the idea there. And so when you're kind of upset about something, a guy cuts you off, or is it, you know, come in and somebody's got too much perfume on and it blows you away and you're sitting there going, ah, oh, you know. Or you, you come in and somebody, you know, they're, they're on their little thing again that annoys you. I mean, you oh, man, look at that. Man, man, man. What does it sound like? I'm, I'm grumbling. I'm grumbling. I mean, that, that, that's, what, that's, that's the idea. We're voicing our displeasure in a low, guttural way. And not only the word grumbling, but also disputing. That's the idea of arguing. They say, no, that's not right. This is right. No, you're wrong. I'm right. And, and it's like, well, what if we did, you know, why we did that? And it, and it starts disputing, and, you know, you, you, you see this happening. Now, I want us to go very quick and to notice some things here. Number one, why do people grumble and complain and argue? Why, why do we complain and argue and grumble? Number one, why do people do that? Because they are not content with others. I mean, that's one of the first things. You know, it, it just comes up pretty quick that it's usually others that, that we're not content with. But, but notice number two, because they are not content with their circumstance or their circumstances. And so, you know, the situation around them is not what they desire, and so they complain about it. They grumble about it. Or number three, it's because they're not content with themselves. You know, so often we think it's about everybody else, but if we really started to peel back the onion a little bit of your thinking in your heart, we come to find that it's not just that you're not at peace with others, you're not at peace with yourself. And then, most importantly of all, and really the root of the matter is, it's because they're not content with God. That God is not the supreme, ruling, and reigning, all-satisfying portion of their heart. There's all these other areas of their heart that God is just not enough for their heart. They have not, by faith, made Him enough of their heart. And so this all flows into all of this results in selfishness. Fill that in. It comes into a self-centeredness, a selfishness by which we can be. And I've listed three ways in which we can describe this. I knew there wasn't room for me to leave the blank, so I went ahead and filled it in. What's the first one there uh, that selfishness can look like? Loud and proud. That's usually what we think of. It's a, well, I'll, this is what I think. Or, that's dumb. You know, why, why are we doing that? Or, why did you do that? Or, you know, it's the loud and proud. When I was in sixth grade, after school was over, um, I, I'll never forget, they were talking about the fact that we were going to go across the street and everything else, but this time we were going to go this way instead of that way or whatever. And I remember just standing up and said, well, Mr. Ham." I will have my say on this. And he said, Andrew Coleman, that's two demerits. <laughs> I declared that I was going to have my say, and I got two demerits. Because, I mean, here I was just selfishly proclaiming to a man that's four times my age and in a position over me what my thought was. 
And I'm thankful that he did that that day. But loud and proud is sometimes what the problem is. Or sometimes it's prim and proper. You know, sometimes it's, now, dear, I cannot believe that you would do this. In fact, um, if you would really think about this matter, and you can very, in a very proud way say to your husband or say to your wife, um, something that's very condescending and something that's complaining about what they're doing. And apparent self-control can actually be mistaking what's really going on there is that this is a grumbling, selfish attitude. Um, what about this one? What about the low and slow, the woe is me? This is the person who's not loud and proud, but everything about their life and, or everything about what they think of everybody else's life is very quietly dissatisfied, very quietly grumbling about the situation at hand or the things that are here. Or maybe even, well, you know, why is God like this? Why does he do this? Why does he do that? Why doesn't he give me this? I have been through this. I have been through that. I have gone through this. I mean, if God was really a good God, if God was really, if he really cared about me, wouldn't he do this? But look at my situation. Look at woe is me. You see, there's a lot of different ways that we can grumble. There's a lot of different ways that we complain. There's a lot of different ways that we can dispute. Some seem more acceptable. Some seem more obvious. But the evident matter of the fact is that we are all representative of these sometimes. You see, selfishness is lonely and unsatisfying. Fill that in. It's lonely and it's unsatisfying. Why is it lonely? Because it's not just that other people don't want to be around grumbling, which is true. Um, misery does love company, as we'll see here in just a minute. That's true. Um, but very often, loneliness just continues to go into a world of self, and selfishness is, all, excuse me, selfishness goes into a world of loneliness, and it's because it's isolating by its nature, and it's unsatisfying. When you are selfish, and when you are grumbling, you know, it really doesn't get better. Does grumbling help the situation? Usually not. Does going and complaining really help the driver's license bureau that day? <laughs> Probably not. It may make things worse. Oh, he's impatient. Hmm. Let's lose his paperwork for a moment. You know, I'm not, I'm not blaming them of that, but they're humans too. And the way the world works, you know, you, you never, you, you, you go be a turkey, you, you, you're going to get more turkey. Um, aimed at you. Um, so it, it rarely helps things, and it's very unsatisfying. I think it's important for us to recognize here, number one, is that grumbling and complaining, it is not God's will that his people grumble and argue. This is very clear from Philippians, but it's also very clear from other areas of the Scripture. Notice that on these, this outline, and I just want to go very quickly, think through some of these. Adam complained about Eve and blamed God for his own sin. I'm serious, folks. Go back and read it. He complained about Eve and he blamed God. That's grumbling. How about Cain? Cain complained that his punishment for killing Abel was too severe. Really? You're the first murderer on the planet messing it up for everything, and you're going to say, this is too severe. He should have been squashed at the moment. It was God's grace that he wasn't immediately smashed into oblivion or into hellfire, but instead God let him live. Look at the next part. Israel complained over and over Moses complained right after the deliverance from Egypt. Israel complained about drinking water three days after God drowned the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. I mean, they just walked through on dry land. Massive miracle, perhaps a million people escaping an Egyptian army coming their way. Soon as they get on the other side, they turn back and they see the Egyptian army coming through uh, the, where the water is built up and God releases it all and drowns their enemy. And three days later, they're going, you brought us out here to die, God. <laughs> really? 
Israel complained about a supposed lack of food a few days later. And then when God gave them the food, they didn't like it after a while. And go read Exodus 16. The Lord became angry with this, and the Lord brought massive judgment and wiped out thousands of them. The ground opens up and eats them because of their complaining to God. They get to the promised land, and they send spies into the promised land, and all but two of the spies come back, and they complain that they couldn't take the land that God had promised. They were grumbling and complaining. Israel constantly complained against the Lord after all he had done. Look at the screen in front of you and look at Psalm 78. Look at Psalm 78. It says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. You can go on and read the rest of that to verse 50. You ought to do that this afternoon and see how he outlines everything that happened as God was delivering them and it was never good enough. Look at Psalm 106, verse 24. Then they despised the pleasant land. Imagine that. They despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured. They grumbled. Same word, murmur, murmur, murmur. That's the idea. That's the word. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness. You see, as God deals with this, he comes and he also deals with it in the New Testament. The New Testament constantly calls God's people not to be grumbling complainers. In fact, he promises, fill it in up there at the top, he will judge it. He will judge our grumbling. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and this is on the second side that is there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is about the Israelites in the wilderness, but it's written to the New Testament church. It's written to a church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had a lot of behavior problems. They had a lot of attitude problems. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with it. And look at verse 8, similar to what we were discussing earlier in the, our service today. But he says in verse 8, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day talking about the, the nation of Israel and all of their disobedience. Look at verse 9. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. And I've underlined it here, verse 10. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. The idea is God used an angel to come and wipe a bunch of them out. Verse 11, underline this. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So, here, this applies to us. This applies to our lives. We see that judgment will come for this. James 5 verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Can you underline that? So that you may not be judged. And he says, for behold, the judge is standing at the door. You see, when you, when you grumble and you complain and you murmur in this way against your, your brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord Jesus is hearing that. And the Lord Jesus is going to deal with that. And there is coming a day when we will be judged according to God's rewards. And there are going to be, I believe, rewards that, that could have been given, but because of our attitude and because of our lack of action, they will not be. Notice here, why is this such a big deal? Now here, number two is really important. Why is this issue of grumbling and complaining such a big deal? You see, we're tempted to think it's not a big deal. We're tempted to think, oh, it's just about grumbling. It's just about, you know, he does that, she does that, I do that. You know, it's just about, it's, it's no big deal. No, this is a very big deal to God. I mean, God opens up the ground and swallows some people numerous times. And there's blessings that are lost 
Look at number two. All grumbling and complaining is ultimately against God. This is against God because it indicates a lack of faith in him. You say, but pastor, I'm, I'm actually grumbling about my husband, or I'm actually grumbling about my wife, or I'm actually grumbling about my kid, and this is, this is where I'm complaining and I'm, I'm having trouble. But the Lord is saying, trust me with this. Walk with me. Let me control your urge to be frustrated. Let me show you how to deny self and pray and look to me and look with faith even toward those that are around you instead of staying in your place of grumbling. Now, the Apostle Paul is dealing with this in the life of the church. You see, it indicates, it's against God, and it indicates a lack of faith in him. Notice Philippians chapter 4, and this is on the screen in front of you as well. Look at Philippians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is saying this in the very, in just two chapters away. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to what? To be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of, placing, of facing plenty and hunger. Wow. Abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, friends, that passage that we have in our bathroom or in our living room or somewhere that's all over Christendom, I can do all things through strengthens him, is really talking about suffering. The picture of that is primarily about remaining faithful to God in the midst of the things that we don't like. And so, are we trusting in him? Very quickly, number three, grumbling and complaining and arguing destroys our witness to the world. So, is it, it, it's not only against God, but it destroys our witness to the world. And that's what a lot of this passage is about. This passage is talking about us being lights to shine in the midst of a crooked a crooked generation. The picture is, is that if we are shining the light of who Jesus is, and that if our attitude is a different attitude than the world's, then they look to us and see something different. But why is this a, a problem to the witness of the world? Because of this. God is a God of unity and right relationship. He is a God of unity. When we grumble against one another, we're going against Him. You see, it's who He is. It's what He desires. The second part there is, in His grace, God is a reconciler. He brings together that which got separated. And when we keep going back to being separated from one another, when a church keeps fighting with one another, we're not showing God. We're showing ourselves. Notice this, grumbling and arguing does not reflect God or his ways. This is not the way of God. God is a God of goodness and grace and faith and self-control and self-denial. He comes himself and lays down his life. Grumbling and arguing reflects sin. It reflects selfishness and it reflects brokenness not wholeness. Grumbling and arguing may indicate even an absence of salvation. And we see that in the text. He's saying, I hope that you actually prove to be Christians. And the idea is, is that if you're just fighting with one another, if you're just grumbling as a church constantly, it may show that you're not Christians. You don't have the reconciler in charge. Now, that's a, that's a serious thing to think about, not only for a church, but also for individuals. And the Bible has a lot of things that cause us to think about, am I acting like a saved person? And there's two options here. You can either be shown to be, be, it would reveal that you actually need to be saved, that you actually need to come to faith in Christ. And you look at your life and you go, man, this is what God's Word says and this isn't me. My life is characterized by something different. Or it might be that you are saved and you're still recognizing, well, I need to step over into strong obedience in this. I, I need to let that go because that's not who Christ is. That's not who God is. And so this picture 
that it destroys our witness to the world. When they look at us and we're all fighting, they look at us and they go, you know, I got that at home and I've got that at work. I don't need it at some optional thing called church. It, it's a tremendously bad witness when Christians are at odds with one another. This is one of the reasons the church needs to protect its unity and the attitude of its unity. It has our witness. And that's number four. Notice this. Unity and humble cooperation shows off God's reconciling grace and power. When a bunch of people are together and they get along with one another, they cooperate and they love each other, what it shouts is, God is here. God has changed their hearts. God has given them the vision and the strength and the way to not declare their own rights all the time and their own thoughts and their own wants all the time, but now they're thinking about others and they realize that the world doesn't revolve around them. You see, this shouts that God is here. You see, unity, fill this in, unity requires a power we don't possess within our flesh. Our flesh continually turns back to itself ultimately in some way or another over and over and over again. But the, the way of Christ, notice this, the power we lack in ourselves is the power of God's transforming love. He comes and he changes who we are. He comes and he works in who we are. There's no doubt that people without God have different levels of this naturally in the common grace of their life. There's some people that are far more hostile, and there are some people that are far more gracious. But ultimately, every person that comes to God is in desperate need of his transforming power. Notice number three here, or the third one that's here. When Christ makes us his own, we are given his humility, power, and love. When Christ makes us his own, we are given this. Romans 5, 5 simply says this, that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. God has poured it out to us. Notice the next part here. When the world sees that we truly love each other, then they know we are his. You say, do they really? Well, I can't argue with Jesus because Jesus is the one who said that. When the world sees that we love each other, they're gonna know that we are his. When we, do we truly love one another? Look at the verse on the screen that's in front of you, and this is, this is John 13, 34 and 35, and, and he says in 34, uh, this is my commandment that you love one another, and then in verse 35, this is what he says. Let's read it out loud together. Verse 35 says what? By this all men will know you are my disciples, that you love one another. That's how they know that we are his. Now, if we don't love one another, they say, what's special about them? Because that's what we got everywhere. But when we really love and care for one another, and then when they see us not only care for one another, but it spills over into caring for them, they go, these people are different. So, this is God's reconciling power in his grace that gets shown off to the world when we love one another. Now, this text, um, I just want to read it up there in verse, look at this, verse 14 at the top. He says, and let's read it again. Look what he says. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, it's a witness holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. He said, you're going to be there and you're going to be rewarded. And it was part of, you know, my preaching of the gospel to you. I'm going to be able to look and say, look at that. Glory to God. Glory to God. The Philippians made it and the Philippians honored the Lord. That's what he's going after. Verse 17, even if I am to be a poured, out, poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Number one, here are the reasons to stop grumbling. Letter A is the first one. Here's the reason. It's for believers' own sakes. And that's what we see in verse 15, that you would be blameless and innocent children of God without a blemish. See, when you're complaining, you're not blameless and innocent. 
you are not trusting God, and you may be hurting the people around you. Not only for your own sake, but how about letter B? For the sake of non-believers or the unsaved, whichever one you choose, that's fine. People who have not been saved. You see, we shine as lights in the world. That's a good reason to stop grumbling, whether you're loud and proud or whether you're meek and low or whether you're real polished in your, gr- in your, in your grumbling. The picture is this, is that we want to show Christ. So, for your own sake, for unbeliever's sake, and let her see, for the sake of your pastors. We see that in verse 16. In verse 16, he says, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run and labor in vain. Friends, listen. It is incredibly encouraging to pastors who are seeking to preach and lead a congregation to look to God and grow in God when the church actually puts into practice what God's Word is saying. If a church hears the Word preached and continues to ignore it and continues to have trouble and continues to just hate one another and there's envy and strife and sensuality, that's very discouraging to a pastor. It's very discouraging to the prophets of the Old Testament, and it's very discouraging to the preachers of the New Testament. And for the last 2,000 years when people have a hard heart, a stiff neck, and they don't listen and they're not changed. But we see in Hebrews 13 verse 17, when you do what the Word says, a pastor pastors with joy, and listen to this, and you do well. When you bring your tongue, bring your heart before the Lord, when you obey what he has said, a pastor is encouraged and you do well. So as we, as we look at Philippians, may we say, this word is for us. Now, I want to say to you, I praise God that our church is unified. I praise God that there's not grumbling and mumbling. I praise God that the vast majority of you do very well with this, especially when we are together, but in the context of the church. Like me, maybe many of you grumble sometimes. But God has called us to have faith in Him and to trust in Him. And you know, there'll come times when there's difficulties that hit us, and we need to remember the word that is preached without grumbling, without disputing, without arguing. Would you stand together as we end our time in the world.